conducted by our guest speaker, Mr. Akash Bansi, who is also a PhD researcher at Loughborough University, a STEM promoter, and is also the head of innovation and student outreach at National Indian Student and Alumni Union at UK. He was also a research associate at CSIR Pilani and has published a number of research papers as well. He also holds the honor of receiving numerous awards like Sir Robert Martin University Prize, Bright Sparks Award 2020, Richard E. Morvin Student Scholarship from IEEE Computer Society, and an Outstanding Volunteer Award from IEEE Delhi Section. Now I would like to call upon our guest speaker to enlighten us all on the topic of deliberate research reading practice and how to pave our path in this field. Uh, over to you, Akash. Hello everyone, um, thank you for joining and thank you Harshata for such a generous introduction. Um, am I audible to everyone? Yes, yes, yes you are. Yes. Start would be great. Okay, that's great. So um, before I start, I would like to ask you guys, do you want me to go through a whole presentation or stuff or do you just want me to talk to you guys? Like just have your questions and answer them. We can have a Q&A session uh, at the end or we can, uh, or everyone can post their questions in the chat. And uh, if, you, if you like, you can take them side by side or at the end, that's totally a point. All right. So let me just share my screen. I did prepare something for you guys to have a look at. Um, all right. A second. Can you guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hello everyone, so my name is Akash Pansal. I'm a PhD student at Loughborough University. Um, I'll go through this whole presentation where I'm gonna answer a few questions that were posted initially about how to read a paper, how to find the right paper, uh, how much time you should spend, how to collaborate and things like that. So I hope you guys enjoy and if you have any sort of questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, I cannot look at the chat box during the presentation, but I'll take up questions at the end. So uh, feel free to just keep on posting them. Thank you. So yeah, my name is Akash Pansu. Uh, let me introduce, uh, let me tell you a little bit about me, what, what I'm doing right now. So I'm from Loughborough University. It is in the UK, one of the, it is one of the top five universities in the UK, uh, number one for sports, for sports engineering. Um, um, uh, one of the top five for wireless communications, the research that I'm working on. So my work at present, it's on active beam steering, millimeter wave antenna arrays. Uh, to simplify it, I'm basically trying to move an antenna without actually physically moving it. So the beam has to bend over and rotate around and it will be somewhere around 28 gigahertz so that it can be used for the upcoming 5G and future telecommunication technologies. So this is what I'm doing right now. Um, these are just some of the pictures from a lab, from my work, the work I've been doing. I'm currently in my second year. Uh, I'm all, I'm in between my experimental stage. I'm doing my experiments uh, as I'm doing this presentation right now. The blue chamber photograph. There's actually something inside it right now, which is running over there, and it will be done by tomorrow. So yeah, the work just keeps on going. So uh, to answer a few questions, let me start with the very first one: How to read a paper? Um, Papers can be very, uh, you know, it, it, it can be very scary sometimes that what to read, what not to read, uh, how to find the right one. And these are generally, some papers are very lengthy, some are very small. Uh, what are the right journals to look into? So I'll try to address as many questions as possible. So to start with uh, understanding a paper, let's talk about a typical anatomy of the paper, what all it contains. So before I do that, let me tell you one more thing. Like uh, there are generally three types of paper. I basically classify papers into three categories. Number one, research papers. The so basically novel work, they, they, they present something new that has been done in the scientific community. <clears throat> Number two, uh, review papers. These are generally where we take up multiple papers altogether on the same subject and we write a review about how the technology is progressing or how this, uh, that particular scientific principle is progressing or how they, they are being used. And we present, or it can be, so for example, in a machine learning uh, environment, it can be 
that they take up multiple algorithms for a particular test case, uh, test all the algorithms all together and to figure out which one suits the best for this condition, or just take one algorithm and test it on multiple cases to find out that uh, how uh, the uh, how good is the performance of that particular algorithm is. So it depends on different uh, scenarios, but at the end of the day, review paper is basically reviewing something in very simple terms. And the third category is a white paper. Uh, white paper is generally published by the companies. They're not published by journals. They're published by the companies and they talk about the new upcoming technologies and their pot potential application. How that particular company is going to use it or how the, that particular company is using that particular technology in their products. So uh, white papers are actually very helpful if you want to find out more about uh, the new technologies. For example, in 5G being forming is something which is uh, which is booming recently. Massive uh, input, massive output arrays, MIMO arrays are very booming. So all these take, comes out as uh, white papers. Uh, Nokia Simmons published them. Uh, Samsung published them. Apple published them. So you can just go to their websites, uh, go to their tech forum, and there they generally have them listed. So uh, understanding a typical anatomy of the paper, we'll fo be focusing majorly on research paper over here. Review paper and research paper, they kind of have a similar anatomy. They do not differ much. Uh, white papers also sort of have a similar anatomy, but there are some other sections to it, uh, which are very generic, where they talk more about that particular product instead of talk talking specifically about that one topic. So uh, a paper generally starts with a title and its authors, followed by the abstract, and then a one-page introduction uh, and then the whole thing, uh, the whole description, how the materials, the methods uh, they own, and all those things. And then we have the results, discussions, acknowledgement, reference, figures, and tables. Um, this, this is uh, something that you will, uh, whenever you open any of the papers, these are the main things that will appear in front of you. So talking about every, uh, every single point uh, in specific, so titles and authors. The title is generally very descriptive in nature. It basically gives you a rough idea about what the paper is going to talk about, uh, obviously. So as an example, uh, when I make a simple Google Scholar search for a particular topic, um, you can look into different uh, titles of the papers. For example, adaptive beam forming algorithm for AFDM systems with antenna arrays. It basically describes that uh, it is going to talk about a new beam forming algorithm. It's an adaptive beam forming algorithm. And it is specifically de designed for OFDM systems with antenna arrays. Similarly, you can look at, you can just read the title and figure out if this is something uh, which is related to your area or if it is something that you're going to uh, want to read it further. The author, the list of authors is uh, the second very most important thing because it tells you uh, who actually wrote this paper and uh, the order of the authors basically specify who actually contributed to it. Who were, the, who were the supervisors or were not very involved, but were the advisory team, were a member of the advisory team, and so on. So if you look at any of the papers, it has an idea. Uh, so millimeter wave mobile communication for 5G cellular, I, it will work. This is one of the most amazing papers that I have came across on 5G, which introduces 5G basically uh, by Theodore Rapperot. It is one of the most popular authors. Uh, he's a professor at NYU, New York University. and um, so yeah, he is the main author who wrote the whole paper followed by his students or his research team uh, who contributed to the different concepts which are described in this paper. This paper is sort of a, re a combination of review and research paper. That is why it has so many authors. A, a review paper generally will have a lot many authors. Research papers do not have more than five or six authors in general. So uh, this basically, dis so uh, once you get to know the name of the author, it helps you find out. So. For example, I found this subject interesting, and then I realized that okay, Theodore is uh, Theodore S. Rapport, uh, is one of the excellent authors, and he he has a very amazing uh, article. I can just Google his name, and I can check out other articles that he has published before, other papers that he has published before. So that is how the name of the author matters uh, matters the most, especially the name of the first author, followed by the for the uh, by other authors in the paper. <clears throat> Second most important part is the abstract uh, or the summary. So once you read the title and once you're done with the authors, the second most important part, the most important part actually in the paper is the abstract because that is something any author would generally write at the very end when the paper is finished. It contains, uh, so it uh, it is basically 100 to 120 words and it describes everything about the paper. 
uh, what it talks about, what are the results that you would expect. Um, and this is the first thing that will come up when you make any uh, search on Google Scholar. So for example, I just uh, searched for millimeter wave antenna arrays. And at the bottom, the text that you see, it is basically the initials of the abstract. And by just reading it, you, uh, you would find out, find more about the paper, what sort of results it is going to present and what sort of things they are going to be in the paper. So it, it makes uh, you, it helps you make your decision more informed about if this paper is worth spending time on. Because these papers can be extremely lengthy and it is very important to understand, uh, do I need to read it or not? One more very important thing is uh, you see there's an option, uh, there's something called cited by 149. That basically means 149 people, other papers have actually referred to this one. So uh, the higher the number of citations, it basically means this paper is more reliable and uh, more worth to, re uh, to spend time on. So yeah, th this is something that you can also look into and wh while you're searching for the right paper. Then introduction. So it, it is the most lengthy part of the paper. It's almost one page long in general. It gives you a literature review, a background of the whole research, of the whole work that is being discussed in the, uh, in the paper. It starts from the very beginning uh, and then talks about what all other concepts that, the, that they've used. Uh, they talk about other similar works and the uh, shortcomings which they try to improve in, the, in, the, in this paper. Uh, and then they introduce the hypothesis, the new idea that they're going to talk about, and uh, the conclusions that you should expect. Because I don't know why, but we just don't like suspenses. We we hate uh, keeping things up to the, uh, up to the result section. We just put them everywhere. So yeah, conclusions uh, are on. There, there will generally be one paragraph talking about the conclusions. What what sort of things would uh, would this paper? Uh, provide at the end of the uh, at the end of it so yeah uh, is introduction is something you can basically just uh, see it through you don't have to just stay in it and read every single line of it but it does help you find out the background if you're not very familiar with the subject or if it is something very new uh, reading the uh, introduction and figuring out what are other references or what the, what are the papers they've referred to and would help you create a study path about what all things you need to read to understand the whole concept better. Uh, then materials and methods. This is this basically describes the whole thing, uh, the different materials they selected, or what are the experimental procedures, or, or how the algorithm works. All the description, all the main description of the paper, how the how they implemented the whole thing is basically described in materials and methods section. It can either be just one section or it can be one section with multiple subsections or it can be a couple of sections. It depends on the author on how he wants to divide his paper so that the uh, readers can understand it better. Um, results, obviously one of the most important part. Uh, introduction does, uh, introduction and abstract does have some uh, one paragraph about the results, but this section will specifically discuss every result in more detail. Generally, uh, what people do is they combine result and discussion se se section to together. A lot of authors keep them separate in results. They just present the results, uh, the raw data, in form of graphs and figures, where they just show, OK, this, this is what we observed, this is what we did, and that's all. And then they come to the discussion section, where they basically discuss every result that, OK, this is the graph that we plotted, but this is what it means, and this is how it should be improved. This is what it was earlier. They compare it with the results from previous papers to help people understand it better. So yeah, result and discussion section are the most important part in a paper. Uh, what you need to do is whenever you open up a paper, you start with the title and the abstract. You can see it through introduction if you're already familiar with the concept. And you can just jump back to the intro, uh, jump back to uh, introduction whenever you need it uh, while going through the material section. The most important part you need to look into is the result and discussion. You need to read them very carefully and understand what are the different results that they've presented. What was uh, what was the view of the author? So uh, any discussion on a, or an argument presented in the paper, it is their own interpretation of the data. Uh, th that interpretation can change for you. Uh, the it is up to the reader's consent that how they they want to conceive that data. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the paper basically will describe author's interpretation and it can be right or wrong for you. It was obviously right for the author at that time. Uh, it may change for the author as well later on and he may publish another paper 
specifying the findings of that paper i just realized that they're not good enough or they're not right and these are the new interpretations so yeah these things are very common in scientific community and they keep on happening so yeah it is important to stay up to date on what sort of uh, research is going on in the particular area so yeah it's not the paper doesn't just end over here there are more important sections uh, like references and acknowledgments acknowledgement basically uh, thanks everyone specifically who funded the project which organization funded the project where did they uh, did uh, all the experiments and everything so a lot of times their own so for example uh, a university does not have necessary facilities and they collaborated with an industry or a or another university they base they will basically be acknowledged over there uh, references they help you find out other papers that are being cited in this one and just create a path on what all things do you need to read to understand that paper better if you if you're confused at any point of the time uh, while reading the paper so now uh, very important question that comes up is uh, i know the anatomy of the paper what all things does it include the important thing is how do i choose the right paper that yes this is what i want to read uh, and this is one that i can skip so so the very first thing that i uh, said uh, earlier abstract is the key it gives you the brief description of the complete work uh, along with the expected results so yeah go through the abstract spend a couple of minutes on it uh, and you will know if this paper is worth reading obviously the number of citations will help you understand it better that yes a lot of people have actually referred to this work that means it is good enough and i should read it so that is second most important thing that helps you understand it number 3 the journal in which the paper is published it matters uh, a lot, some people may say it doesn't but there are a lot of journals which charge you for some, uh, for publishing and they just publish it in like a couple of days they're not worth it uh, they do not go, uh, review your paper properly they do not do anything so yeah those papers are really not worth it so look out for the journals uh, for highly reputed journals ieee transactions is one of the examples then uh, nature is the highest uh, reputed journal elsevier has a lot uh, scopus have a lot so you have to simmer around and just figure out what uh, specific journals you want to look into and what journals you want to skip citations would help you a lot in that case because uh, a very good or very reputed journal will have papers which are more, more cited compared to any uh, Uh, any other journal so yeah once you look at the citations that will help you understand oh yes this is the journal that you can uh, look into or that you can understand yeah that yes the results in this one will be more trustworthy a lot of times it happens i've seen papers where uh, the results are fake they, they uh, so uh, when i tried to replicate the whole thing it didn't work there was a case when i was actually designing one of the antennas in described in the paper and later on i realized one of the dimensions it specified was 2 mm while in reality they basically forgot to pro provide like to place a decimal point before it it was 0.2 mm so it basically destroyed everything and i was like okay that's a very very small mistake but yeah a, a reputed journal will not make those mistakes a small journal will simply ignore these things so that is a very important key to understand what journal is it published in and what where to uh what where you are finding the papers uh another very interesting thing is where are you looking for your for papers to read so google scholar is obviously one of the best places to find the papers because it basically almost uh have the direct uh, have access to all the directories uh iriple explore uh, have is one of the major publishing house for engineers uh so yeah most of the papers are over there acm is for computer science students scopus elsevier and web of uh, science they are combination of engineers uh, computer scientists and people in physics chemistry or others uh, or biology the core sci uh, scientific community worldcat um, it's a very interesting website it gives you uh, so you can just uh, name of the paper or the subject that you're looking for it gives you links to all the books all the papers uh, regarding it and if you want to get a hard copy of the book it also shows the libraries near you where you can actually find that book so yeah if you cannot buy a book because a lot of times when some of the books are extremely expensive you can just go to worldcat and find out which nearby library can you get the book at some general tips to help you out 
um, whenever you're reading a paper, take a print out of it or just open it in a PDF file. If you have an iPad or something, it helps a lot. And just scribble around, just uh, write down your notes, uh, mark important points over there. Because so that and just save it so that whenever you open it up back later on, you won't spend more time on reading the whole paper again. Rather, you'll have your notes on uh, on the site and you can just use it and then understand the whole thing again. It happens a lot, especially when you're, you're into research. You'll end up having hundreds of papers and you'll you'll keep forgetting what paper uh, which paper de describes what. So it, it always helps to scribble around and to just record everything. Um, further, do not go for very old papers unless absolutely necessary. There are some papers which are published in 90s or 80s, uh, but yeah, they they are something that cannot be re replaced till date. So yeah, well, I'm not talking about them, but in general, try to stay as modern as possible. I, I have this general rule of thumb. I do not, like I try to stay within a uh, six to seven years uh, gap. Uh, I generally ignore papers before that because it's 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 a long enough time for the technology to develop further. There are some papers that would be very interesting, and uh, that is just a smart decision to take that to see if yes, something from 2010 is it worth reading right now? It's it's been 10 years and things have changed a lot. It, uh, so uh, yeah, try to stay as modern as possible. If you put a lot of old references. People will like when people read your paper, they will be like, oh, no, they haven't looked into the latest work, and especially when your paper is being reviewed. They, they go through it like oh, your paper does not have new references or your work is dependent on the old technology and you haven't looked into the new work and it may just get rejected. So, yeah, it is important to stay modern, to stay uh, up to date with the latest uh, findings in your area. And you can always use cita citation management tools. They're very helpful. Uh, Mendeley is the one that I use. And they help you keep a record of all the papers that you've been reading and later on to cite them when you write your own. Whichever platform you use to search your papers, uh, every platform provides some sort of additional benefits. So for example, Google Scholar have some, uh, some special tricks, uh, I would say. That if you put something in double quotes, that word will become a compulsion during the Google search. Similarly, it, ha uh, it is uh, similar to all the tricks in Google search. Every platform has its own. For example, I triply explore when you search for a particular topic. So for example, I just write antenna rays. It shows me a whole list of what 80,000 papers. I cannot similar through 80,000 papers. And then there is an option to search within the search results. And you can add another keyword. And then it will just keep on sorting them out. So these things help you out uh, to find more specific papers. There are filters available on those websites for which you can specify. I would just want to look at papers from past five years or past six years or past 20 years. You can use all these tools to filter out the right papers that you want to read on. This is uh, like, I just quickly went through the whole thing about how to read paper and how to choose the right paper. Uh, one very important thing that uh, is, to collaborate with others. How do you collaborate with others? How do you reach out to someone? And uh, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I've worked with people at IIT Delhi. I've worked with people at IIIT Delhi. I've worked with uh, people at different uh, universities abroad. I'm work, uh, I worked with CSR CD. I worked with Bats Pilani. So yeah, the, I uh, during my undergraduation at MSIT, I did try to reach out to as many people as possible, try to collaborate as, with as many people as possible. So this actually helps you increase your portfolio to how, and your increases your professional network. Uh, and yeah, th this is something that you should always look into. So there are basically three most important ways or three most interesting ways that you can look into. The very first one is using LinkedIn or a platform like ResearchGate. Uh, where you get to meet your fellow researchers or your fellow uh, or your fellow colleagues in the same area from different places of the world, uh, connect with them, drop in a message, be as professional as possible, be as specific as possible. People do not have time. Like if I get a mail which is oh, two page long, I'll just ignore it. But if there, there is something which describes everything in like ten lines, I would be happy to read it. And if it is something that interests me, I would reply back to it. Same goes for any professor or any lecturer. So uh, the most important, most interesting way is to email them. 
email is uh, anyone outside india would rather uh, prefer uh, getting things into the email rather than getting them on their whatsapp uh, it also goes uh, it is also the same for almost all the professors in india in the reputed uh, universities please uh, so before you write an email to anyone research well about their group about the work they they're working on about uh, about the research they're working on and what you want to work upon because if uh, do not just make a generic email and just send it to 50 professors all together tailor one particular email for every professor dependent on their work and what you want to work upon and just send them an email and do not copy paste because uh, i i have been into that situation where i basically copy pasted it and i forgot to change the name of the professor I was mailing and i just got a, re- a reply from them that Uh, either you're very bad at copy pasting, or uh, I don't know. You you just don't know the right name. So yeah, do not do do not copy paste. One very <clears throat> one trick that I would uh, uh, that I figured out, uh, which actually helps out a lot. A professor would generally get hundreds of email every day, and he would just ignore them, or uh, any email box would only show fifty emails at a time, and. Uh, others just go to the other pages and a professor does not have a time to look at them one of the best ways is to figure out oh, which country you are mailing to and decide uh, like figure out w- how much is the time difference and set your email in a way that he receives it at 8 or 8:30 in the morning because that is the time when they get into the university turns on their computer and they look at their mail and if you are emailing them at that particular time your mail will come on the top and the chances that they will read it will be comparatively higher if you're an iiee member get an iiee email account email them through your iiee email account because they may ignore a generic gmail uh, a mail from a generic gmail account but there uh, if they are an iiee member there is a higher probability that they'll read something which comes from an iiee server further uh, go to conferences even if you do not have a paper that you've submitted you can still attend the conferences you can still attend the talks over there uh people present their papers over there you can just sit in any of the plenary sessions and just listen to the papers and you can just later on go to that particular post and meet them talk to them uh network around and uh, t- discuss about discuss your work tell them a, a little bit about your work and then just re- request a possibility of connecting with them further you may be able to share contacts uh, sh- uh, share your email addresses or uh, or your phone numbers and that that basically helps you create your network further It, all these things they help you out build your network which helps you uh, helps you in the future so to give you an example of the conferences i met dr vishnu shrivastava he was like he retired now but he was an emeritus professor at csir cv palani uh, it is one of the biggest organizations in india for microwave research and i met him at one of the conferences i just uh, discussed a little bit about uh, his work uh his work was at terahertz tubes he was at that time he was working on a, on a project and he was presenting it in a conference and later on we just shared our email addresses when i was in my uh, when i was in my last semester uh, and i was looking for jobs uh, i didn't wanted to get into a, uh, into a normal job i wanted to get in, into a research based environment i just emailed dr shrivastava that i'm interested in working on this particular areas and i know that you've been working in these areas and uh, as if there is a possibility that i can work at csir cv and he basically invited me to join his team uh, and i get uh, i got a chance to work with him so yeah all these things reaching out to them collaborating with them it helps out a lot uh, this is the whole like short presentation thing that i can tell you uh, do you guys have any questions i'll be happy to take them on thank you so much uh, akash yes we have some questions in our chat section yeah all right so how much time and effort should we put in reading cited papers and references it depends um so if if the if the technology is something that you do not know at all about spend as much time as you want to read the cited papers and to because uh once you so for example once you start working on a project and you look at a paper and you you are stuck at a point you'll have to go to the referred work and you need to figure out uh, and it it is just a chain you go from one paper to the uh, other referred one and there you will find another paper which is referred to another one 
there was a time when i actually was stuck in a cycle and it just kept on repeating itself so it, it it's a smart decision that you will have to take at some point and if uh, it's not just you have to depend on the cited work you can also <clears throat> you can also look out for books or uh, other papers or just search that particular term and read other papers you don't have to depend you don't have always to de- you don't have to always depend on the cited papers so it's it's a smart decision from your side that oh, how much time you want to spend on it uh is it advisable to read open access preprints oh yes 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 open access preprints preprints they help you read read the work even before they get published this helps you stay uh, ahead of the curve stay ahead of the whole community to know what sort of things are coming up a lot of times uh, uh some of the most amazing papers they come out as preprints and they just uh Uh, and you just get a chance to look at it, uh, look at it first of all look out for specific journals through which you do, you want to check out preprints do not just read out every preprint obviously uh, uh, so for example if something something which is going to be published in nature and is available as a preprint i will obviously read it because there is not, not uh, in the publishing community there is nothing bigger than nature so uh, uh, again it, uh, you'll have to look out for the right preprints similar through them through by reading their abstract as well how to access those papers that are not accessible by google scholar which are not free oh yeah so uh, there are a lot of papers which are not free i triply charges for you uh, charges for them uh, either go to your uh, university library almost every university library or every college library have access to i triply explore or uh, other important journals if if you do not find something uh, there is something called sci hub that you can look into uh, it's in it's a community built up by a woman i don't remember her name but she created this website where you can just put in the url of the paper that you're looking for and it downloads it for you so yeah you can just check out sci hyphen hub just google it um, and you'll have to f- uh, you'll find a link where you just paste uh, the url to the paper that you want to uh, read and it will download it for you um okay when i generally start reading the paper i tend to read about something else rather than focusing on the main topic when you are into research um reading is the key like if if you if it is very difficult for you to pay attention to reading something um it will tend to become very difficult for you i'm being very honest this happens a lot with me as well while reading i tend to just divert to something else or within the subject i tend to just move on to something else um you just uh, take out your time keep your phone and everything away when you take up a paper take out something that you actually want to read and just spend a uh, spend a specific amount of time if you cannot focus for the whole full for the whole 1 hour or 2 hours just spend 10 minutes on it that is more than enough to get basic details out of a paper and then just skip it ahead or read it after an hour or so but if you if you're skipping if you see that you're skipping it out a lot um, you need to f- figure out a way to make improve your attention span further should we read a paper word to word no you don't have to read a paper word to word uh only the abstract section and i would always recommend to read discussion section at the end word to word because the, these are the main areas introduction you can just simmer through you don't have to read the whole thing word to word but yes a lot of times something that you do not understand well or if it is something completely new uh reading it all throughout uh, helps what is a good number of citation there is no good number of citation um if you Uh, a paper takes years to generate a number of citations honestly a paper would have like 5 or 10 uh, citations in like uh, one year and then it just keeps on multiplying further if it is a good paper <clears throat> so you do not have to look into that uh, it has a thousand citations it is more important you'll also have to com- complement it with the year it is published in so for example if a paper is published in 2020 it will obviously not have hundreds of citation even a five uh, even if it has five citations that means it, it was published a couple of months ago and it already got uh, referred by five or the papers that makes it really interesting to read so you uh, this is something that you have to take both both the factors into consideration and then decide 
Uh, should I try to specialize in one field or try to read paper in other fields also? Uh, I would, I generally always recommend to specialize in one field because this is where you want to progress later on. This is where you want to build your career in. But yes, uh, reading papers in other areas also help. So uh, it depends on what other areas interest you. I know a lot of like, I read some papers related to cosmology. Uh, I spend a lot of time over there. But that, that's just a hobby. I don't do it because it is a part of my career. Uh, my uh, millimeter waves, uh, RF, uh, RF engineering, antennas, antenna arrays. This is my research area. I regularly read papers for uh, for those particular journals, uh, for those particular uh, subjects. Uh, apart from it, all the other things, it's just for my interest, for my uh, for, uh, to just keep myself updated and what's what's happening outside. One very interesting thing that I would recommend is uh, subscribe to journals. Uh, there are various publication houses or journals which have their own magazine. So, like for example, if you want to see, I've got a few over here. So yeah, so for example, this is Microwave Journal. Uh, they publish almost every two months, the bi-monthly. So you can subscribe to these. They're free of cost, and they send a uh, send a hard copy to you at your home. Um, they have some really good work uh, and they help you keep uh, stay updated on what's happening. <clears throat> Is it beneficial to convert project documentation into papers? Um, it depends on what sort of uh, project documentation is it. A lot of times a project, so for example, if you're just building a line following robot, I'm, I'm not going to say that, just convert it into a paper. Think about, uh, is it something novel? Is it something new that you did? Or and is it something that has not been published before? If it is so, then yes, obviously uh, go for a paper. If it is not, there is no point doing it. When you go for publications, um, it, do, like, it is obviously an achievement if you get a paper done, if you get, uh, get a paper published, it is obviously an achievement. But I don't want, like I never recommend people to take it as an achievement. It, it's it's a responsibility for you or for us because whenever you publish something you're saying that i have progressed i have uh, made some progress in one of the scientific uh, scientific areas and i'm informing the scientific community so take it as a responsibility rather than just a goal or an achievement that you just need to make so this this will help you stay honest to your work and this will help you uh, write a very good paper rather than just writing a paper So um, any other there, yeah, are there any other questions? Like if anyone wishes, I'll stop the recording to answer it's more questions. Uh, if you want to ask in person. Um, is it possible, like, can you guys tell me what sort, what areas are you guys working in? And if you can tell me um, what work are you doing or, or any particular project you're working on right now? Um, all right, so if we talk about uh, the responses we got when we uh, uh, like when we released the form for ADA, the paper implementation and reading club. So yeah. most of the people who were interested uh, were from the beginner and intermediate levels, and they were more interested in areas of machine learning. So okay. the crowd is more about going about machine learning. So yeah, I mean, if you, I'm not from machine learning background, but I can tell you just one thing about that, that if you're going to go for machine learning, do not just stay in the application side, like do not just stay in the front end, understand the mathematics be behind it. That will help you publish uh, in a very highly reputed journal rather than just publishing it anywhere. Like a lot of people just skip the mathematics portion of it and just stay in the application area, uh, which is not going to help you at all anywhere. All right, so uh, if you guys have any, any other questions, I'll, I can wait for a, a couple of minutes. 
Yeah, actually, I had a question. I wanted to ask that, uh, like you said, uh, it's it's some sort of uh, it's somewhat a cycle that uh, one gets stuck in. Like I will go through citation three or one paper, and then I'll get stuck in it. So, uh, but but uh, at the same time, it's very you know difficult because of uh, imposter syndrome. So, like, uh, how can one get out of that uh, cycle of citation three and you know keep this imposter syndrome at bay? Just trust yourself that what you're doing is correct. And when you when you see yourself getting into a cycle, uh, get out of it. It's not very difficult to to get out of it. All you need to do is you need to realize that yes, I'm stuck in this cycle. Once you understand that yes, I'm in this cycle and I need to stop, you will be able to do it. And when when uh, talking about the papers, when you go from one cited paper to another cited paper, when you see that this chain is going too long, just stop and look for the keyword, Google it and look out for or just open a book at the end there's an index look out for the word and just go, uh, read it in a book more specifically a paper would describe that particular thing into more detail that you may not need to understand and a book would give you a more generalized view of it which will help you go ahead uh move on rather than just stick staying or being stuck at that one point and if if that subject or that particular topic is not in any of the books, congratulations, you're some you're onto something. Spend a little more time on it, and you may be able to find something really interesting. Thank you. I have one more question. Like uh, since uh, we have like uh, started and convened the. Club, I wanted to ask that uh, we have a mixed bag of students, like they are beginners, they are intermediates, and they are advanced. So, yes. uh, like, what advice would you give to us as uh, you know conveners of this club? Uh, that how should we go about this? Because we do not have like uh, individually we are working on any project or uh, even as a collective we are working on something. It's not possible to have a mentor at every moment, you know. So, uh, so how should one go about it like, without mentor or at sporadic mentorship? Is that so? That's my question. It's a very good initiative that you're doing right now. It's very good that uh, you're reaching out uh, to the student community and helping them get into the research because especially in our colleges like MSIT or MATE or uh, other similar colleges which are not IITs or NITs, uh, the research side uh, gets suppressed a lot and we just end up attending classes, giving exams and trying to find a job. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, I'm uh, very excited to see something really interesting going on over here. Uh, to give you an advice, when uh, you have a very interesting community who is actually interested in it, do not try to find more members. Rather, do not focus on quantity. Stay on, stay with the quality. Stay with the people who actually want to work in this area. And for, like you can divide them into separate groups uh, depending on the subjects, depending on their expertise. You can always find, uh, you, you cannot have mentors every day, but you can always find one mentor per subject from uh, someone from the final year of your college itself or someone who, is, who recently graduated from the college or one of your faculty members at the, uh, at the university or at the college. I know at MSIT we have some professors. Uh, if you want some connections, I can help you with uh, some people from BETS or CSIR uh, who, will be, who will be happy to take up something like that. So that is something you can look into. Uh, Feel free to reach out to people. Cold emails help out a lot. They may not work every time, but writing it, writing an email is is a key. Try to understand how to reach out to other people, um, collaborate with other people, and see where it can take you. <clears throat> it is very easy for people in computer science to um, to really do anything because they all they need is a is a good com a computer system with with the right softwares. When it comes to an electronics background or an electrical background or a mechanical background, <clears throat> it starts to incur a lot of cost, right? So what you can do is you can look into simulation environments. How can you simulate that particular design or that particular technology? Um, you cannot actually publish through just through simulations, but it gives you a guarantee that if you actually make that thing, uh, it would work. Uh, you can always create projects, reach out to communities like IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee, IEEE Site. Reach out to individual chapters like IEEE, MTTS, EPS, uh, IAS, PES, all these societies, they have specialized funds for such projects. And I'm sure they'll be happy to help you out if you want to actually implement something. 
and uh, at the end of the day for everyone in the community uh, who is going who is a member of it or who is going to be benefited from it if you are planning to get into research even if you're planning to get into a job uh, which is sort of in an r and d environment uh, this sort of activities help you a lot in building up your knowledge as well as your profile um thinking about other topics related like having a broader view rather than focused which makes the work hard uh, mostly when we have deadline yeah so uh, if if you're trying to stay in so when you get into research you you do not broaden your uh, your research area you try to keep on narrowing it down so you have to actually go other way around it uh, you should always read other uh, uh other papers from the related area to in the broader environment to just keep you updated and updated on what's going on but uh, do not spend a lot of time in those topics because uh, they, they are not something that you are actually looking for you're you're looking for one specific thing uh, try to focus over there rather than diverting yourself into other areas anything else par par i can help you with no that was great thank you very much uh, right. yeah i'll roll out a last call for questions if anyone to uh, ask anything they may like come forward or drop it in the chat section yeah uh, meanwhile if you wish to reach out feel free to reach out these are my details um, these are my social media handles you can just reach out to me and i'll be happy to help Thank you so much, Akash. This has been a great session, and uh, it was really helpful for the members of our uh, community. And we are definitely going to reach out for your guidance uh, if we require again. And uh, it was great. Thank you so much for joining us. So we are glad to have. Yeah, you. I think there's one more question just came up. Yes, it's a section. If you can. Yeah. So should we focus more on technical aspects or theoretical parts? Uh, should I try to prepare a project on each paper? So first of all, um, there isn't much difference between the te technical aspect and the theoretical part. Uh, uh, technical aspects are important when you're actually trying to implement the project. Theoretical parts are important when you're trying to publish it. Because, uh, so uh, let me give you a very simple example. When I started my PhD, uh, when I started the second year of it, uh i worked upon a technology uh, i worked upon a design and it was working perfectly and when i presented it to my supervisors uh they're like oh, awesome amazing it works great now find out why why is it working so things doesn't just stop because we just melded a few things combined a few things or we just did some wear and tear and it starts working we actually have to find a reason why is it working as well where the theoretical part comes into focus so when uh, if you're getting into if you want to work into research if you want to get into that area you need to focus on theoretical part as well but yeah uh, technical aspects will help you uh, build the project the theoretical will help you publish it and no you don't have to con try to convert every paper you read into a project or every project you do into a paper a lot of times uh, a lot of time it will happen that um you'll do one project and will keep on modifying it so find a stage where you think your work is novel your work is good enough to be published do not just keep on writing paper on paper because this uh, at the end it will not help uh, it will increase your portfolio of papers but if it, if they if they are not good enough people are not going to read it and they'll just lie over there and they'll not help you out in any way so yeah figure out the right uh, right projects that you wish to convert into a paper and then write them down you can always look out for help around you can ask your teachers to support you with that uh, i'm not sure what college you are from but uh, at msit i know a couple of professors a couple of teachers who are always there to help so you can always reach out to them and uh, see if uh, it can be published do read the literature the background that has been published before that will give you an idea if it is worth publishing or not
So I think we are through with all the questions. I have dropped the link uh, for the Google form for joining the club, bit.ly slash radiate. So feel free to share it with people who are interested in research, who are interested in reading and implementing uh, and conducting research. So uh, with this, I'll conclude and I'd like to thank our guest speaker for today, Mr. Akash Pansal, for his valuable guidance and for this enlightening session. I'm sure this session would help uh, all of us uh, in facilitation and working of our club and will also cement up these practices. Uh, also, with that, I'd like to say that uh, since it, this was uh, such an informative session, it was helpful for uh, a beginner and also for people like who are working on their own research paper all, all, all life. And all the tips, especially the, you know, the uh, Google co uh, the, the quotes one and the in IEEE Explore, you can like uh, sort through this. So it, these were great tips. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot once again. And thanks for the recommendation for Mendeley. I've been using Zotero for a while now, and and I, I wanted to switch, and I, I had no other option. So thanks for that recommendation as well. So I think that we can conclude this session now. Thank you once again so much. For All the best, guys. Today. All the best. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right.